like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. to the National University of Singapore Young Lunin School of Medicine, the Healthy Longevity webinar. Thank you for joining us. Today, we are talking about economics. I think a very important topic if we are thinking about the health span and human longevity. And Professor Andrew Scott is with us, and I will introduce him in a second. As always, we really like to hear from you. So please use the Q&A function to send your questions. Our short presentation today will be given by Shara Kampimpin, and she is our research assistant and is embarking a PhD trajectory. And she will talk about telomerase therapy, reversing vascular senescence to extend lifespan in progeria mice. Shara. Thanks, Prof. Andrea. Hi, everyone. My name is Shara, and as mentioned, I'm a research assistant in Prof. Brian Kennedy's lab. There has been quite a lot of excitement in the field of reprogramming using Yamanaka factors, and very recently we heard about the success of one lab in rejuvenating a woman's skin cells to become 30 years younger. Today, I will be talking about a very interesting study done by a team at the Houston Methodist Research Institute, where instead of Yamanaka factors, they use telomerase therapy for vascular rejuvenation. All right, so just a brief background in hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome, also known as HGPS, and its relevance in aging in research. HGPS is caused by a de novo mutation in lamin A gene that results in an erroneous omission of 50 amino acids. This results in a truncated form of lamin A termed as progerine, and because of this deletion, progerine lacks the post-translational processing splice site that causes progerine to accumulate in the nuclear envelope and alter nuclear morphology. This progerine accumulation is associated with cellular alteration associated with aging, such as telomere attrition, which is a key hallmark of aging. Shortened telomeres are susceptible to DNA damage, and the resulting DNA damage induces inflammatory responses and senescent phenotype. Children with HGPS presents with accelerated aging, and 90% of the patients succumb to cardiovascular diseases. In this study, endothelial cells were generated from iPSCs from HGPS children and their non-HGPS parents, and telomerase mRNA, or HTERT, was used to treat the HGPS endothelial cells. They then observed the various changes and effects this treatment has on HGPS. They found that HTAT treatment not only extended the telomeres and endothelial cells, but that they also restored their replicative capacity and improved endothelial function. They also found that HTPS endothelial cells, which possess morphological features similar to senescent cells, were more circular and had a greater 2D surface area. But in the treated HTPS cells, they found that the cells were more elongated with a smaller 2D surface area, just like the non HTPS cells. They also found that they have reduced progerine expression and normalized nuclear architecture. They also found that in HGPS uh, versus non-HGPS transcriptional profiling, that there were at least 1,000 plus genes that were dysregulated, and 265 of these that were related to endothelial cell identity, cytoskeletal structure, and DNA damage repair response were rescued after treatment. 
The team was also interested at looking at the inflammatory cytokines that were expressed in H3PS, and they noticed that 73% of these were reduced in the, H3, uh, in the H3PS treated ones. H-TERT treated H3PS endothelial cells also had a protective effect on the vascular smooth muscle cells. H-TERT treatment was also found to reduce DNA damage markers in the H3PS endothelial cells and induce SIRT1 expression. This is interesting because aging is often associated with diminished SIRT1 expression. To provide proof of concept for in vivo telomerase therapy, they then use a prodroid mouse model, which was generated by a knock-in of mutated human lamin A. This prodroid mouse model was then injected with murine telomerase or m -tert, at three and six months of age. They observed that the vascular cell adhesion molecule VCAM1, which was elevated in prodroid mouse, was reduced in the treated mouse. Key genes in endothelial cell homeostasis, such as von Willebrand factor, factor, tissue plasminogen activator were also reduced. They also observed that in the treated mice, progerin expression was greatly reduced and SIRT1 expression was enhanced. Mice that were treated were also observed to have at least 20% extended lifespan. So in conclusion, primary cause of morbidity and mortality in HGPS and elderly is in cardiovascular diseases. So it's very interesting for us to actually take a look at this. They also found in this study that telomerase treatments were able to increase telomere length, reverse abnormal gene expression, and endothelial cell function, reduce progerin expression and DNA damage, enhance SIRT1 expression, have a protective effect on vascular smooth muscle cells, and extend lifespan. I think there is really room for us to explore telomerase therapy in vascular rejuvenation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shara. Um, I, I think we will have a look at telomerase activity and the lengths, et cetera, and also to see how that relates to all the hallmarks of aging. I think we can learn a lot from Progeria models, but let's see. But first, um, we will talk about economics. Um, and Andrew uh, Scott is here with us today. It's my honor. He is professor of economics at the London Business School and co-founder of the Longevity Forum. And Andrew has previously held positions uh, at the Oxford University, at the London School of Economics and Harvard University. And he focuses, as I already said, on the economics of longevity. He also wrote uh, two books and he co-authored The 100 Year Life. Actually, this is, I have that book. It's on my bookshelf in, uh, in Singapore. And he also co-authored at The Long New no, the new long life, that's what it is. So, um, Andrew, uh, the floor is your, it's really nice to have you here to really shine a light on the economics, which is very often missing, I would say, that topic within the biological field uh, we are working it, and especially also in the medical field. The floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for the invitation. I think what you and Brian are doing is great, and indeed the whole Singapore project is fascinating. Uh, and as I said, I'm an Economist. I'm not a scientist, so thank you for uh, uh, hearing me today. Um, one of the things I love about longevity is just how broad the topic is and how interdisciplinary. And the reason I got into this as an economist was I really felt that, by and large, economists were not looking in the right area. We focus a lot upon aging and end of life, but not on longevity. And I'll try and explain the difference between the two. Um, uh, I'm going to go through a lot in my allotted time. I, one of the ironies of talking about longer lives and what we do with them is I'm forever running out of time in presentations. But uh, uh, I'm going to try and cover four broad themes, and I'm going to cover some of my academic research, as well as some of the work around the 100 year life, which is just trying to get people to engage with this topic and recognize its importance, but also how, in many ways, we've got things wrong. So let me just bring up my slides in the traditional way. Um, so I'm going to talk about what I call the economics of the longevity dividend, which is the title of my research grant that I have. And I'm going to focus on four things. I'm going to first of all, just tell you my way of distinguishing between what I call an aging society and a longevity society. Then I'll go through uh, the importance of aging well, how we deal with longer life, and how societies can try and get a positive from this. Because I got in this topic giving a talk about an aging society, how there's a rising proportion of older people and how that's bad news. 
Now, I'm not sure it is bad news. It seems really good if we're living for longer, but we can come on to some of the complexities of that later. But all previous improvements in health have brought about improvements in the economy. And so we should be able to do the same thing if we can age better. So that's uh, how I'll finish the, the talk. But let me begin with an aging society. This is really a demographic story. I've got some charts here about Singapore. And you'll have heard this story many, many times over. Every country, as it starts to go rich, goes through a demographic transition. You see a um, fall in the birth rate and you see more people living for longer. Uh, and as a consequence, you see a change in the population structure. So in 1950, there's a Singapore's population structure, lots of younger people, far fewer older people. But you can see what's happening now. This is no longer a pyramid. It's turning to something like a cruise ship and a really one of those really big mega cruise ships with more and more older people based on a smaller number of young. And, you know, two things driving that falling fertility and longer lives. And Singapore is a really pronounced version of this aging society story because it's got one of the lowest fertility rates in the world and it's in its fertility rate fall incredibly sharply. So this aging society story is a real issue for Singapore. In my own country, the UK, it is an issue, but not so pronounced because we haven't had such a sharp and such a fast fall in the birth rate. But what this is about is a change in the age structure of the population, more old than young. And that's important. I have to say it's normally dealt with in a very negative way. I mean, if I look at this, what's brilliant about this is it's fewer children to mourn. It's fewer parents snatched away in midlife and more grandparents meeting their grandchildren, which sounds fantastic. But we do tend to turn it into a negative. There's more old than young. Now, this is looking at the world population, and it's showing you these demographic pyramids over time. And I'm going to say that there's another way to look at this chart. The standard way, of course, is to draw a line from, say, 60 years right across and just say, look, there's just loads more people aged over 60, 70. You choose your number. An aging society, a change in the composition of the population, more young versus old. But I would say that we need to focus more on a longevity society. And if you look at this chart and don't draw a horizontal line, but draw a vertical line, the thing that's really changed is kind of whatever your age, you're going to live longer. There's a greater chance of becoming older. And that's obviously spectacular if you're young, but you can see it at every age. So rather than horizontal and just say more old people, if you look at it vertically from a longevity perspective, whatever age you have, you have more time ahead of you. And that's, of course, focusing not on fertility, but on longevity. So here we've got life expectancy at birth in Singapore. It's an extraordinary rate of progress, around two or three years every decade. And I'm going to sort of come to what I think is the most fundamental change that has happened. Because if you ex sort of extrapolate those changes, these are UK government numbers for uh, life expectancy at birth uh, of a child born in different age groups. And you can see that the current generation the UK government says, well, if life expectancy trends continue in the future as they've been in the past, you might even live to 107 is the sort of average age of death. But even if those trends slow down, we're talking about a life expectancy of 95. Now, an ageing society says it's all about people being old and end of life. But I want to focus again on this longevity and show you what I think is the really, really, really key change that's happened. Not that there are more old than young. And to do that, I've got what are called survival curves. So this just shows the probability of someone being born reaching an older age. So if you look at the blue line in 1751 in Sweden, a newborn had a 60% chance of reaching the age of 24. What I want to show you is look what's happening to these survival rates more recently. The probability of a newborn becoming old is increasing. Now, if you now look at a 50% chance of how long someone might live for, even assuming no further changes in uh, longevity, we're talking about 85, 80, uh, late 80s. In other words, for the first time ever in human history, the young now have a majority expectation of becoming the very old. That's never happened before. For most of human history, yes, there's been old people, but it's been a minority of older people. Now, of course, the aging society story puts out at a population level and says, look, there's a lot of old people, not many young. But I want you to think about that, you as an individual. If, of course, you've got very little chance of making it to an old age, then you focus on early life, midlife. 
But if for the first time ever in human history, the young can expect to become the old, then we have to do things very differently. You have to invest in your future much more. So this is why we are entering a new period of humanity where the young have never been more likely to become the very old. And that changes everything. And that longevity perspective is what I try and focus on. And I've tried to draw some distinctions here between an aging society and what I call a longevity society. An aging society tends to be negative, or the burden of older people, end of life, and their medical costs. A longevity society says you've got more time ahead of you. What do you want to do with that time? An aging society story tends to focus on decline. A longevity society is about investing in the future and making the most of that extra time. An aging society story tends to imply that aging is inevitable. A longevity society says, well, you've got more time ahead of you. How do you exploit the malleability of age? How do you age better? And of course, whatever your age, you have more incentive to age better than any previous generation. An aging society says this is all about old people. A longevity society says it's about everyone. An aging society story says this is a problem for Singapore and not for Africa. But because life expectancy is increasing globally, this is a problem everywhere. We also need to focus not just on end of life, but all of life. If we try and do something about aging when we're very old, you can do some things, but it's not giving you enough runway. The aging society also tends to encourage intergenerational conflict. It's a battle between young and old. But of course, if longevity is the young have never had a better chance of becoming the old, we really need to work not on an intergenerational back conflict, but how the generations move together. So that's the starting point of how I see longevity versus an aging society. Let me now talk a little bit about some of my work around what that means in terms of our health and putting an economic value on aging better. Now, of course, we know from COVID that health is incredibly important. We've taken steps that have hurt the economy in order to save lives. So we know that health is really valuable, but I'm going to go through some of my research just showing just how valuable it is and what that means. Because, of course, when I point out to people that they're likely to live these long lives, the thing everyone worries about is being ill. Because this green line here shows you the burden of disease uh, in the United States, the number of illnesses and diseases you like to get, and it rises with age. And, of course, what we're seeing with these survival curves is more and more of life occurring in years where health is not so good. So this is the big challenge. We know we have these longer lives. We worry about our health. Now, there's some good news. We're not just living longer, we're also on average uh, healthier for longer. So this is some uh, unpublished work that I'm doing at the moment, looking at uh, England. And what I've got here is a measure of frailty or the incidence of disease. And you can see in the charts that if you compare someone born in 1940 to someone born in 1960, they're healthier at every age. So there are signs that on average, we are aging better, which is great news. Although if you look more closely, the news isn't quite so great. The first is that that improvement in health at every age is not keeping up with life expectancy gains. So life expectancy is growing faster than healthy life expectancy. Also, the aging process shows huge diversity. We know that from our own experience, but you can really see it in the socioeconomic factors. Uh, whether people are aging better depends enormously on their education, which part of the England they live in, and also on their wealth. Effectively, uh, if you've got low education and low wealth, you are not seeing improvements in how you age. And on this right-hand side, it's just a simulation from our results about how frailty develops comparing two different types of individuals, one living in the southeast of England, which is more prosperous, and one in the northeast of England, uh, and showing the difference not just by region, but also someone in the southeast with high wealth who went to college, and comparing that with someone in the northeast with low wealth who just left school and didn't go to college. And you can see the really dramatic differences in how frailty develops over time. The other thing is if you look at how uh, people are aging better, a lot of the improvements come from being able to do daily activities, being more mobile and cognitive ability, education has increased. But there's not a lot of signs of improvement in terms of underlying conditions. It's more how we live life and deal with it rather than the underlying health risks. So what I did uh, in a paper that came out of Nature Aging with my colleagues, Martin Ellison, who's an economist at Oxford, and David Sinclair is a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School, is try and use economic tools to put a value, a dollar value, on various forms of health gains, looking at healthy longevity.
I won't go into too much detail. The paper was a lot of fun to do. We've got four different cases and they're drawn from literature. Uh, one is what we call Strudberg from Gulliver's Travels. And that's a world a little bit like what's sort of been happening in the past where life expectancy improves, but there's no real improvement at each age with our health. So we just get longer lives, but in ever diminishing health. Then there's Dorian Gray after the novella by Oscar Wilde. And this is a world where actually we don't see any gains in life expectancy. It's just, we start to age better. We just stay forever more healthy until perhaps we're young forever. So this is just gains in healthy life expectancy, but not living longer. Let me do what we call Peter Pan, which is where actually you slow down biological aging. So rather than age biologically 12 months every year, you may at biological age nine months every year. So what you see there, of course, is you live longer because mortality is lower at every age, but you're also healthier at every age. You sort of 50 becomes the new 40, that type of stuff. And then we look at a, a case called Wolverine, which I won't talk much about, which is sort of rejuvenation, where you don't just age more slowly, but actually you can go back in time and reset your biological clock from 50 to 30. These, of course, are theoretical cases, but they match into different scenarios that people talk about. Now, what is interesting in going through all these results is a number of findings. The first is, even under Strudberg, which is where health starts to diminish, longer lives are valuable. You know, living longer is a good thing, but of course, if it's in diminishing health, the value gets less and less. And that gets less and less for a couple of reasons. One is your health is worth less, is less, so you value that extra year less, but also you have to take resources from earlier in life to those years. So it, it reduces quality of life earlier on. It's still positive, but it diminishes and it's less. What is incredibly valuable is making sure that health span matches lifespan. So the Dorian Gray story where you don't increase life expectancy, but you're just adding years of health to life is phenomenally valuable. I'll show you in a moment. In fact, you know, based on current data, we show that for the United States, it's far more important to get health span to match lifespan than any further increases in life expectancy. But the Peter Pan one is interesting because, of course, you get increases in life expectancy and you get improvements in health. And that unlocks some interesting synergies, because basically the better your health, the longer you want to live. And the longer you live, the more you want your health to match it. And I come back to those complementarities, those synergies, because that's really important understanding where we are right now. But the punchline, of course, is enormous gains to how we age. This is just showing you, uh, for comparison purposes, uh, the value of one more year of life, but not aging better. That's the blue line. With one more year of healthy life, but not living longer. That's the Dorian Gray line, the orange line. And what you can see is that improvements in health are far more important than just improvements in longevity. And the scale here, by the way, is hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we're talking about 500 being half a million dollars. These are incredibly important. Even extending life is important, but healthy life is incredibly valuable. What we can do is we can use our tools and say, okay, let's imagine we could slow down aging by a year. So you live in longer for a year, but also you live in better health because you slowed down your biological aging. And then for a bunch of countries, sadly not Singapore, uh, we calculate the, uh, the dollar value to society of those gains. Uh, and that's that very, very final column. So if the United States could slow down aging uh, such the biological clocks, you've got an extra year of life and improved health. It's worth $51 trillion in present value. If you work out the sort of the year by year number, it's about three or 4% of GDP. And go back to COVID. If you think about the steps we took to try and save lives with COVID, we did see falls of three or 4% in GDP. And that equates to a sort of similar type of metric. In other words, these are staggering welfare gains. I want to stress here, this is not the boost to the economy. This is not the cost savings. This is just how we value life gains. This is using economic tools to value health improvements. And it says there are few things as important as our health. And as we're living longer, the most health, important health challenge is to age well. But the other thing is why this is new. Because of course, you know, we've always had older people but there's two reasons why these numbers are so big today. And they're pretty obvious. The first is what I was saying earlier, which is that we now have a very high chance of becoming old. When you only had a 20 or 30% chance of becoming old, tackling aging, age related diseases wasn't very important. But as the probability of the young becoming old increases, it becomes important for all of us. And so on the left hand side, you can see 
for the United States, just how the value of aging better increases just because the young have an increasing probability of getting old. When you have a 10% chance of being 80, we don't worry about age-related diseases. When you have an 80% chance, it's suddenly the most important health challenge we face. On the right-hand side, there's the other reason at work, which is actually the value of aging better is greater the older you are. So the more older people you've got, the greater the value. So these two things together, more old people, the probability of becoming old increasing, means the value of aging well is just getting greater and greater. And that leads to a virtuous circle. I talked about this, this interaction for what I call the Peter Pan case. But we've got a really interesting moment in human history because for the first time ever, the young will become old. So aging well is the most valuable health thing. But we have an interesting circle, virtuous, virtuous circle here because the better we get at aging, the more we're going to value aging better. When we reach our 80s in poor health, we don't want to reach 90. But when we can get to 90 in good health, then we're interested in going even further. Every previous health improvement, like improving infant mortality, the better we got at improving infant mortality, the less interested we are. We move into midlife mortality. The better we are in tackling midlife mortality, the less interested we are in midlife mortality. But what this logic says is the better we get at aging, the more valuable we gain, for, we value further gains to aging. It's a very, very powerful, virtuous circle at work. It also, of course, comes down to this sort of simple logic because I often tell people, hey, here's the data, you're gonna live a long time. And people say, I'm not sure I want that because I'm worried about my health. Well, put those two together and you get this third conclusion. What are you gonna do now to maximize your chances of aging well? This is the most important health challenge that we face in the world. I wanna stress though, that of course, aging well isn't just about health. It isn't just about biological science. I said earlier that education helps people age better. There's loads of ways we have to think about our future self, our finances, our skills, our level of engagement, our relationships, our sense of purpose. What all of this has said is that when you live a long life, when you've got a much higher probability of reaching older ages, the most important thing is to age well, which means you've got to invest more in your future self. Aging is recursive. So whatever you can do now to give yourself a better platform in the future is going to pay benefits. It's why this also is an all of life, not just an end of life issue. We have to think about the young and not just the old. That's going to bring me to the sort of how I got into all this, which is through my book, The 100 Year Life, which has uh, wonderfully been a, a bestseller. I think we're up to about 800,000 copies sold globally now, and, uh, and particularly in Japan, but also in Singapore and elsewhere. And really, this was me just thinking in a lecture kind of what really has economics got to think about when we think about these longer lives and I want to say it's really about two things it's about time and it's about malleability so let me try and explain time as I look at the clock um you know ignore the first 20 years of your life ignore the last 10 years of your life give yourself a weekend take some time off in the evenings to rest everything else I'm going to call productive hours I don't mean you have to work during that time, but it's time you could be doing something with. Now, if you live to 70, you have 125,000 productive hours. If you live to 80, you have 156,000 hours. And if you live to 100, you have 220,000 productive hours. In other words, the exam question society is being set is what do you want to do with another 100,000 hours? This isn't about end of life. It's about all of life. Time is a social convention. We structure it in different ways. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But of course, what this means is whether you're 30 or 60 or 80, you have more time ahead of you than past generations. The second thing that's really important is what I call malleability. And obviously, with scientists here will know what I mean here, because this is about how do we improve the relationship between biological age and chronological age? How do we age better? Because if you're living longer, as I've just said, there's enormous value to aging better. But the question is, how do we as a society think about this extra time? And it's not just extra time at the end of life. At every stage, we've got more time. In the 20th century, we literally invented teenagers. The word teenager, I think, is first comes up in about the 1930s. Before the 20th century, we had children and we had adults. We also invented pensioners in the 21st, 20th century. We invented retirement. We invented a three-stage life, education, work, retirement. 
And one of the challenges we've got at the moment is governments in trying to manage longer lives, they're just trying to stretch out that three-stage life. They're just making people work for longer by pushing out the pension age or the retirement age. But actually, if you've got more time, you want to do things differently. Imagine if your day went from 24 to 32 hours. It really wouldn't be sensible just to stretch everything out, to increase the gap between breakfast and lunch and lunch to dinner and just make the work day longer. You'd want to do things differently. You would structure your day differently. You might have five smaller meals at different points in time. They may, three of them may still be called breakfast, lunch and dinner, but they'd look different. We would look to respond to more time by changing how we structure time. And that, of course, is what is already happening. We're seeing some pretty big changes. These are UK data, but these are pretty broad global trends in rich countries. We're seeing younger people do much more education. They have a longer career ahead of them. We're seeing females have children much later at the first age. So the average age of first birth in the UK has gone up in just 30 years from 26 to 29. You're now much more likely as a female in the UK over 40 to have a child than a teenager is. That's never been the case before. We're seeing marriage happening later. We're seeing falling divorce rates, but not amongst older people. And of course, we're seeing more and more people working later in life. So we are already seeing a big, big change. And of course, one of the things that has to happen if we live longer is we have to work longer. I can't finesse that in any other way. You know, if you're living longer, you need to work longer. So how do you support that longer career? How do you support your skills? How do you support your productivity? And it's really important in managing this long life, not just to focus on the financial assets. Yes, you need to think about your finances, but actually life is requires a number of assets for you to monitor. Financial assets, your productive assets, your skills and knowledge, your vitality assets, your, your mental and physical health, as well as your relationships, but also your transformational assets, your ability to deal with change and transition. Because over a longer life and a longer career, you will see different stages and you need to deal with those transitions much more. It's a mistake just to focus on your financial portfolio. You've got to be thinking about lifelong learning. You've got to be thinking about investing in your future health, but your mental health as well. What keeps you not stressed? What keeps you relaxing? How do you form good relationships with your children, your grandchildren, even your great grandchildren and the neighbours around you? And how we deal with the inevitable fluctuations that occur. So we argue in our book, The 100 Life, myself and Linda Grattan, that we're going from a three-stage life to a multi-stage life where your career is made up of multiple stages. The concept of retirement is changing dramatically. It's no longer an event which everyone does at the same age. It comes to where work comes to a hard stop. We're seeing people work for longer. We're seeing people do flexible work. We're seeing people become entrepreneurs. We're seeing people doing social entrepreneurship. But if you're 20 and you're likely to be working into your mid-70s, which is perfectly plausible, you also need to think about doing your career differently. So you may start your career later. You may spend some years exploring. In your 50s, you may say, you know what? I've had 30 years in one profession. I've got another 20 to go. I need to do something different. And so we're seeing a multi-stage career with all sorts of shifts and transitions, which require big changes in our culture, but also in our educational institutions. So the 100-year life was focusing on careers. And it says people will work more and more into their 70s and 80s. Yes, you have to worry about your finances, but just sorting the finances out is not the only thing. Life will become multi-stage, far more transitions. New stages will emerge. People will behave differently. The malleability of age is not just biological. It's what you do at each age. And of course, if every 50-year-old has got more time ahead of them than past 50-year-olds, if every 70-year-old has got more time ahead of them than past 70-year-olds, you should behave differently. We talk about biological age and we say, you know, 70 is the new 60 or whatever, but really 70 is just the new 70. Hopefully they're healthier than past generations. They've also got more future ahead of them than past generations. So let me then just briefly, as I come to the end, focus on the step back and think about the whole of society. And this is an economic longevity dividend. We have to achieve a three-dimensional longevity dividend. We already do have longer lives. It's really important to make them healthier. I've shown you the economic value to us. Few things are as important as aging well when we have these long lives. But also we've got to make them productive, both as individuals and as a society, we have to make sure that we can finance these longer lives. Now, I want you to believe that productive is not just about earning a salary, because people can be productive in lots of ways. 
caring for grandparents, caring for grandchildren, helping out in the community, they're all productive uses of time. And we also know that over that long life, having a sense of purpose is really important. But as a macroeconomist who's particularly interested in GDP, it's crucial that governments also make sure we get this third dimension right. Because if on average we're living longer, if on average we're healthier for longer, then that should be good news for the economy. But we have to think not just about increasing the retirement age or the state pension age. How do we keep people productive for longer? This is already key. Uh, some, just some simple calculations looking at numbers. But you look at the G7 countries in the 10 years before COVID, 100% of employment growth can be explained by an increase in employment by those aged over 55. The main source of growth in the economy now is not young people entering the labour market, it's older people staying in the labour market. So absolutely crucial for GDP growth is ensuring that people aged 50, over 55, over 60 have the skills, the health and the ability to work. That, of course, means tackling ageism, but also means making sure that firms and individuals are aware of this challenge. Because right now, employment starts to fall before retirement. How do we keep people in employment for longer? So this is uh, the United States. Uh, you're showing, I'm showing you here employment by age. And you can see that between 1990 and 2020, older people are working a lot more. For some people, that's great because they've got the skills, they've got the health, they've got the education. For others, it isn't. Inequality is a real challenge here. But notice how things start to decline from 50. And that decline in employment at age 50 is not mainly people saying, I want to retire early and I can. This is people losing their job because of ageism in the workplace. It's people losing their job because they haven't maintained their skills. It's people having to give up work because they've got to care for older people or that their health themselves isn't very, very good. We spend a lot of time working on the first half of life because now the young will become the old. We have to really focus on this second stage of life and try and make sure we support that. Singapore, of course, is doing it, but this isn't just about end of life. This is about lifelong learning, the type of jobs that older people want. So I want to try and tell you that there's two things happening in the economy. There's what's called the silver economy, a rising number of older people. And I often hear organizations say, what a great opportunity for business you know, care homes, dementia, adult diapers, all of those things. And that's true. There's a large silver economy, there's more old people. But the thing I think is really important, what I call the evergreen economy, the longevity economy, is the young becoming the old. And yes, I will be prepared to spend a lot of money if I get old and need to be in a care home and get dementia. But I will spend a fortune to avoid getting dementia or ending up in a care home. So the really, really big thing here, given how important aging well is, is what I call the evergreen or longevity economy. Too much focus on the aging society, the silver economy and end of life, which gives all this a very negative spin. Of course, the end of life is important. Of course, it's incredibly important to give people a good ending. But we've really got to focus with longevity, not on end of life, but on all of life. And that has huge implications the health and pharma sector, the food and beverage sector, education, finance, leisure, real estate. We need to adapt our economy to support these new longer lives. So we're in search of a longevity dividend. The real change that's happened is not that there are more old people than young. That is, of course, important. But for the first time ever in human history, the young can expect to become the very old. We need to run our life differently, think about health differently. And we all of us need to invest more in that future. And that's not about end of life, it's about all of life. It's not just health, finances, purpose, engagement, inclusion, and relationships. Of course, all of this challenges deeply held views about what we think it is to be old, how old you are when you are old, what old people do, and what it is to age. But for the first time ever, the young have a majority expectation to become the old. We need to rethink all of that and the connections about what we do over our life. Gains to healthy aging are enormous. Achieving a three-dimensional longevity dividend is key if we're going to support this longer life and make the best use of it. Um, uh, and Andrea, already, uh, Andrea kindly referred to the two books. And here's some other ways to uh, keep in touch with me and my work. I'm really looking forward to the conversation with uh, Andrea and, uh, the, and your questions from the chat. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea. Fantastic. I, I really love the uh, longevity society as a, as a term. Tell me, because there's such a transition, I think we need to do from an aging society to a longevity society. 
what is the role of an individual? What's the role of university, of, of public and private entities? What's the maybe even the role of uh, big agencies like the WHO or UN, etc.? Tell me, how do we make that transition and how do we support that shift? Yeah, and, and it's, it's a great question. Of course, it's all of them, which makes this such a difficult space to work in. I mean, clearly governments have a big role to play. Um, you know, public health, preventative health, all of those things are going to be key. Uh, changing our educational system so we're not just obsessed with people under 21, but actually say, wow, there's a big market at all ages. I think public awareness is key. It's one reason why I sort of try as much as I can to get people to understand this confusion between aging and longevity, because I think once you get it, and it is, you know, the, the hundred life has been wonderfully successful, but people say, you know, reading the book changed my life, which which is terrifying me at first, because, you know, I can barely manage my own life. The idea that people are changing their life from what they read, but it, I think it's what we need. This is a really unique moment in human history. It's a takeoff point. And we've just got to think differently. So it is individuals. Um, I think the other thing, it, it's a lot of experimentation. I mentioned teenagers being invented in the 20th century. And as life got a bit longer and as education extended, we suddenly had people who weren't at work, who weren't taking on those full adult responsibilities. And we invented a new stage of childhood. Literally, my father was never a teenager. He left school at 14. He got a job. He's in, yep. the, in a war at 17. He's got a married at 18, a child at 19 and a house at 20. Whoa. But there's a lot of experimentation involved in creating teenagers. How do we use this new time? So I do think experimentation is key and that has to come from society. But I keep stressing this inequality around longevity as well, because, you know, there's, uh, a, you know, if you look at m my country, the inequality in life expectancy and healthy life expectancy is tremendous. Uh, you know, I live very near to Kensington and the difference in life expectancy between North and South Kensington is something like 10 years. And, you know, some people have the resources and the time to invest in healthy longevity. For others, it's much harder. It's much more day to day. So there's a huge government responsibility here as well. Yeah, and that's what you beautifully actually showed. So the accumulation of frailty points, et cetera, being more frail in the socioeconomic status. And socioeconomic status, of course, is highly associated with lifestyle choices and with the environment you live in. So could you, or were you able in your data analysis to disentangle what is individual, some we call it sometimes individual choices of a lifestyle. It's, I think it's also a given a certain lifestyle at a certain point of time, but then also you have the environment that you have pollution, you have noise levels, etc. Yeah. So yeah. have you been trying to disentangle that? I, I haven't personally, there are, of course, there are some, some work on that. And we know kind of the difference between genetic and broader environmental issues. I think, you know, that it gets a blurred line because of course there are some choices we make, but our choices are restricted by our choice architecture. So, you know, if I wander down a street and there's only fast food restaurants, then I can make choices, but my choices may be very, very limited. Um, what was interesting about those regional differences that we saw, uh, you know, there are clear regional differences between Northeast and Southeast, I showed you, and that very, very stark. But actually looking at the averages is misleading. What you find is that what's really driving those differences in averages is behavior at the tails. Uh, and so it's the sort of the, the, the number of people in the bad outcome states that is really, really key. And, I, you know, I, I suspect that's a lot about limited choice rather than bad choices and environmental pressures and challenges. And, you know, this again comes back to public health. Public health did phenomenal things in ensuring that improvements in infant mortality were spread out across all income groups. And I kind of feel we need the same again for 50 plus. You, you really nicely showed that virtuous cycle. So the cycle, if you um, became a 50-year-old and you're healthy, you want to become that 60-year-old, also becoming healthy, and you forget to invest in that 50-year-old, doesn't it mean if there are people who will not become 50 in a healthy state that the heterogeneity within the population is much bigger in the end, and that is the end result? Yeah, no, I think uh, I, I think that's absolutely what is happening. I mean, the, the economic logic is all very simple. It's all about probabilities. And of course, if the probability of being 
so I'm writing a new book at the moment. I talk about raining in London. And, you know, if, if there's a 10% chance of rain today, I don't go out with an umbrella or a raincoat. If there's an 80% chance, I go out with an umbrella and a raincoat. And of course, in London, it's normally 80%. But for most of human history, we've had a 10% chance of getting to 80. Now it's an 80% chance. So we've really got to think about doing everything differently. But it's those probability weights that happen. But of course, what that then does is, as you put higher probabilities on future events, you get more and more interested in it. But it is this unique moment for human history, because again, go back to that point, people say, I don't want to live to 100 years if I'm going to be in ill health. But that has the obvious implication that if you get to 100 and you're in good health, you're going to probably want to shoot for 110. Now, I'm not saying that's feasible, but I'm just saying that is the economic logic that means that as we have these longer and longer lifespans, we'll put more and more resources into trying to age better. And the only limits will therefore be the social and biological ones that stop us from achieving whatever that might be. But the more we improve our health, the longer we want to live, and the bigger the gap between life expectancy and health span, the more we're going to try to close that gap. Hence that really powerful virtuous circle. That means that you know I, we've slipped into a new moment for humanity where this is really going to be our increasing focus. So you said we, we have more hours ahead, and I really liked your, um, your calculations, how many hours that would be if we would reach 100 years. I think that's a challenge for individuals, how to tr structure that. And I'm not sure, what, what's your opinion? Should we, because now we know what's going to happen, should we structure it for individuals? Should we have educational courses, how to do that? And can we learn from the past, I think, where we just learned by doing, and then at the certain time there was the keyword teenager and was born, and there was the third generation university, um, and it was a quite, if I uh, see the last 10 years, of course, and it, next, it, is, it is an explosion of what you can do with your remaining time. But do we need a little bit more structure and a little bit of a framework around that to help individuals to, to, um, to, to use their time and maybe even more efficiently and also for society to get that return of investment back? Yeah, no, I, I agree. So Mark Freeman, uh, who runs Encore, a man I, I think is always a fascinating man, says we don't have a midlife crisis, we have a midlife chasm. We don't have the institutions to support change and renewal in midlife. And I think that's a great line. And I, I think there's a lot of truth in it. So, you know, we, we, re, we rely upon social norms. Imagine, you know, if you were reach 18 and, and you've got no idea what people do with their life and you're said okay what are you going to do with the rest of your life that's a really hard question to answer so we look around and we sort of then establish social norms that kind of work and you know in the 20th century a short retirement literally retire and go somewhere and sort of spend a few quiet years perhaps playing golf and teenagers were created and that was a social norms and they were new they were very new that's not right for the length of life we've now got. So we do need structure, but we also need experimentation, which I think you can see a lot of at the moment. And of course, when it comes to education, we are seeing, uh, you know, Singapore has uh, education credits for uh, older people, but there's a lot to learn too, including that we know that older people learn differently from younger people. So we've got to find different techniques and different ways of helping them, um, but completely. But I think the, the smart thing here is, to look around and see what's happening rather than to look backwards and think what your parents did or to be judged by that. Uh, and it is a very active space right now. And some things will work, some things won't, but I think that's kind of the fun of, of this space right now. My last question before handing over to Stephen Rutch, who has, I think, lots of uh, questions from the audience. Right. Do people know how long they still have on earth so do they really is it an active process of a 40 year old really calculating i have 45 years left it's funny at the beginning of most of my classes on this i asked the audience sort of uh, how many of you thought how long you might live for and only about one in three put their hand up uh, and then when i asked them you know what do they use those who have thought about it they say, well, I thought about my grandparents and how old they were when they died. And of course, given those increases in life expectancy, that's a challenge. Yeah. We also have a problem which is illustrated in COVID is that governments announce uh, what's called period life expectancy, um, which is 
a very static concept of life expectancy. It basically assumes that a child born, say, in 2022 lives the whole life in 2022. So that when they reach 80, their mortality rate is based on an eight-year-old in 2022. So those period measures of life expectancy tend to underestimate true life expectancy. And I showed you those UK government numbers based upon what's called cohort that tries to predict forward. So I, I think most people probably aren't aware. Um, I think that the, the biggest problem is perhaps not just an awareness of the future time, but we just segregate out being young and being old. It is truly extraordinary. And I think part of that is things like these generational labels of baby boomers and Gen X, et cetera. Because of course, Gen X will never become a baby boomer, but they will become older. And I think you know that's that challenge in a world where for most of history, the young haven't become the old. We do have quite a firm separation between young and old, but the real change now is the young can expect to become old. And I think that's the thing that we haven't quite sort of grabbed onto yet. Stephen. Oh, thank you, Andrea. And thank you, Professor Scott, for your wonderful, fantastic presentation. Um, it was very uh, insightful, very clear. Um, just have a few questions from the audience. So maybe I'll start off with the one question, which actually I think was kind of inspired from the introduction section of this webinar where um, Shara was doing the journal club talking about telomerase enhancement therapy. So the question, I mean, from your perspective as an um, uh, economist, um, how much would um, the described, you know, telomerase enhancement therapy or, uh, in matter of fact, other um, uh, therapeutics such as stem cell therapy for anti-aging and the longevity market, um, what do you think this uh, impact would yeah. be on um, the economic viewpoint? No, great question. Um, and you know, I can't speak about individual treatments. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was an effective treatment that was really successful and was really cheap? And of course, everyone's terribly excited about the prospects of metformin and the TAME trial. Uh, but you know, I suspect a lot of this stuff's gonna be very expensive. Uh, and I'm sure it will get cheaper over time, but it's gonna be expensive. You know, I've got a couple of thoughts on that. The first is I often see um, uh, particularly from the health and the scientific community saying if we could age better we'd save all this money because we wouldn't be spending it on hip replacements etc um, i think it's a mistake to argue for longevity improvements that it will save us money um, i think it's likely to cost us money but actually because our health is so valuable that's okay and again i'll come back to the covid example where if you work out the sort of dollar billions that we paid in order to save lives it's a huge huge number Health expenditure as a share of GDP increases, and I don't think we'll stop that. So, of course, that makes it all the more important to get the longevity dividend, the longer working careers, the productive careers, in order to pay for it. But I, I, I do suspect that some of this stuff's going to be really expensive. So then we have to make sure that we minimize the costs. And I think there's lots we can do about drug trials, which are very, very expensive right now. And, you know, we'll probably slow down both the rate of innovation and certainly the cost of treatment. Um, but I, I suspect it won't reduce costs, it will increase it. But we have to also worry about diversity and inclusion from that basis as well. Speaking about costs, uh, you were mentioning about costs. So this uh, second question is about what are some of the major short-term or long-term fiscal and monetary policies that should be implemented in a population that is now living longer? Uh, yeah, and I can see that's from David, who's asked a, a cluster yeah. of great questions. <laughs> um, so, so the first thing I, tr I I'm, I'm, so my background is with monetary and fiscal policy, so I, I could talk more than probably David would like me to on this one. But what I'm really keen to do is to get monetary and fiscal policy makers to understand that aging isn't just a negative for the economy, but there's a real positive. And, you know, there's all these long run projections that governments make around fiscal policy that is all doom and gloom because of a rising number of older people. So what I'm trying to get them to say is, well, actually, if you do spend money on preventative health, if you do spend money on later life education, if you do fund the you know, biological research and aging, actually, there's a kind of, there's potential for a very, very good payoff. Um, I think the short term fiscal and monetary policies don't change that much. There's a big debate at the moment that says the reason we have such low interest rates is because of aging. And I do think longevity keeps interest rates 
long-term interest rates quite low. Uh, but I do think on fiscal policy, it's thinking about where you allocate your expenditure and your health budgets. Um, uh, I think a, a very big issue though, is what I call the intergenerational dimension. So as life gets longer, you're seeing not just inequality amongst older people, but you're seeing more real estate in the hands of older people. And so it's getting more and more expensive for younger people to get a house. Some of that I think is okay because the lifespan's increasing, but there's a lot of intergenerational wealth challenges coming about because of that. Uh, and I think you're gonna see a lot of younger people voting to tax housing because it's mainly in the hands of older people. And I think we need to really be sure that we look at what I call intergenerational audits when we think about fiscal policy. I'm really worried that in response to having a lot of older people, governments will give them resources, but they're not gonna solve the real longevity problem that the young will also become old. So we've got to make sure that the younger generation are gonna have a pension, a house and a health that supports them when they get older, rather than just say, how do I finance the current generation of older people? So for me, intergenerational views on fiscal policy is really, really important. Another question um, is about what are some of the practical advice that we can do individually to plan ahead and future ready ourselves in a society that is now living longer? Yeah, so it is really hard. And, you know, I, um, how do I get people to understand this? And I, I think the simplest advice I can give is to make a friend of your future self. Uh, that's the real issue here. As life gets longer, short-termism is going to be more and more of a problem. So how do we become more patient and longer term? Now, Singapore's got a pretty good record of thinking longer term and being patient compared to the UK and the US. But at an individual level, it's how do we have these nudges to make sure that we make good long-run decisions rather than short-run decisions? And at least for me, conceptualizing it as... I've got a lot more of my future self and I have to make a friend of them is really important so that on those big decisions, I don't just think what I want now, but think what can I give myself in the future? And I don't want to plan my life. You know, I, I do not know what my situation will be in 10, 20 or 30 years time, but options are really valuable. And you know, if you think about a financial option, the value of a financial option depends really on two things, the, the volatility underlying share and how long you hold the option for. As life gets longer at every age, options are important. So giving yourself the option of different career choices, good health, money, and good relationships seems to be the heart of all of this. In your presentation, you also did talk about your research in different countries, um, the UK and Sweden, for example. So um, this next question is, um, from your observations, are there any countries that you believe are doing a good job um, better than others in preparing for the social economic opportunities and impacts of a population that is now living longer and can it be modeled upon and learn yeah. from the example of those countries so i mean i i'm it's probably not the answer well, i don't know if it is the answer you want i mean singapore obviously is doing is more forward looking than most in thinking about this I, I, the challenge i think singapore has got and it's similar to japan and china is it's got these two challenges longer lifespans and then a big shift in the number of old versus young. So there's two different things to wrestle with, an aging society and a longevity society. So it's just as well that Singapore is focusing on this so much, but it's got that, that double challenge. Whereas in the UK, we haven't been as good as Singapore as life expectancy, but we also haven't got such a dramatic change in age structure. So it's a little bit easier in some ways for the UK. So I do think Singapore is the most forward looking. What I have started to notice is that governments are beginning to wake up to this longevity agenda rather than aging society because it does have a more positive message. It's about time and malleability. And it says we can do something about this and it's an opportunity. And I'm also noticing governments are beginning to wake up to the commercial opportunities of that, because if the whole world is aging, then if you can generate the industries that help people age well, then you've got some enormous uh, commercial opportunities there. So I'm beginning to see a, something of a change occurring, but I would sort of say that Singapore is in the lead. And I can see Steve's asked the question why Singapore hasn't got a longevity gain. It, it absolutely has. It's just that it's fall in its fertility rate means it's also got a dramatic change in the age structure of the population. So it's got these two things. The young definitely have got this really enhanced probability of becoming old. They've got to think about those longer lives. 
but the fall in the birth rate is so dramatic. There's a lot of older people. My worry is that Singapore will focus disproportionately on how to deal with the current old rather than ensuring that the, the future old, the current young, become the healthiest ever. Just, um, I just wanted to pick up on your last point where you're talking about a longevity society and aging society. So how ready do you think uh, our societies are uh, able to adapt towards a longev longevity society rather than an aging society? Um, so it depends on your expectations. I mean, I, you know, this is a pretty fundamental change that we're, is occurring. So I don't think we're going to spin on a dime. And sometimes, you know, when I hear about the scientific progress, I, I'm not a scientist, but it's sort of dramatic. And I sometimes worry that the science may make more rapid progress than our behavior and in institutions, um, because, you know, we've got a lot of adapting to do with the changes that's already happened. I, I am optimistic. I'm an optimistic person, as you can probably tell from the presentation. The 100 Year Life came out six years ago, and it was hard to get a lot of people interested in it. I was kind of going out knocking on doors things have changed a lot in six years you can really feel things are already beginning to change but it's going to take a long while to find out how to make best use of this time what are the best ways to age better how do we change our pension how do we change our education how do we change our social norms so for me it's water dropping dripping on a stone eventually it gets there but it takes a long while it will take, uh, take a long while, but what I really liked is one expression of yours. It's not about the end of life, but it's all of life. So thank you so much, Andrew. I think everybody learned so much, a really different way of thinking of longevity. Um, and hopefully we can work together on the longevity society. So That's thanks good. again. Please, you as listeners, please use the chat function uh, for your comments and uh, feedback. We, after the end credits, we have a little bit of news of our School of Medicine and what we do in the Center for Health and Longevity. As you know, I said last time, last week, we have a new website. So please visit, leave us also your comments if you want to participate in one of our studies. Please uh, be in touch. Uh, the 19th of May, there is the next session. Um, our next speaker will be Dr. Davide Vetrano, and Brian Kennedy will be the host. And I'm closing today's webinar with a lovely video about a penguin. <laughs> Take care. Mas daí todo mundo dizia, ah, não, mas ele não volta mais, não, não volta. Eu digo, bom, não sei, não posso dizer de sim nem de não. No dia que completou. Quatro meses certinho, ele chegou aqui na praia, estava em pé bem ali. Quando ele me viu lá no portão, ele já veio com aquela alegria. No dia que ele queria ir para o mar, ele foi embora essa segunda vez, aí saí aqui chamando ele, ele veio atrás de mim, cheguei ali, eu digo, vai, vai para o mar, vai. Aí ele olhou para lá, rodou de novo, tornou a me chamar. João! Mas eu não, eu não vou embora com você, não. Eu não sei mergulhar igual a você, não. Se eu soubesse, eu ia com você. Aí ele só fez tchum, mergulhou, aí só desapareceu. Aí, rapaz, eu digo, pronto, meu dindinho foi-se embora. Às vezes, quando ele sai lá pra fora, eu de noite sonho brincando, conversando com ele. Eu digo, pô, acho que eu, eu, eu tô ficando maluco. O pinguinho lá pro mar e eu sonhando, brincando com ele aqui. Acho que ele vai pra Patagônia. Eu tinha vontade de, se eu pudesse, eu ia visitar lá esse lugar dos pinguins lá. Eu queria ver se eles ficavam no meio dos pinguins lá e eu chegasse e chamasse Tidinho. Ele vinha direto, ele, se ele escutar minha fala, ele vem. <risos> Like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it. And nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down.